All right, here we go. It's the new Jesus, the lamb that becomes a lion. Yeah, today we're going to talk about a dimension of Jesus, his life story, his character, how he went from the, the lamb of God or God's lamb to become the lion of Judah. It's not only Jesus' journey, but he was a prototype for each one of you all and for myself. And we're going to follow and see how our journey is to take us from being positioning ourselves as a lamb, which will enable us to become a lion. So we welcome you to uh, transform our world, New Orleans, voice of the kingdom. And let's get right into the teaching. I want to look for a minute at the three characteristics of a lamb. Oftentimes, we hear that Jesus is what? The Lamb of God, right? And as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, we often think of him as the sacrificial lamb that went to the cross, died, took the sin upon, the sin upon himself for the world, and redeemed us, which is all true. But I want you to look at today how Jesus was called the Lamb of God, not just because of his sacrifice, but because he took on the attributes and the characteristics of a lamb. And what I mean by that is I remember doing a study of, of lambs or sheep as opposed to goats. And here are three characteristics that describe a lamb. Number one, lambs are very obedient animals, which means that lambs follow the command of their shepherd. Goats are totally opposite. Look, you tell a lamb to go left, they go left. You tell a goat to go left, it goes right, it rebels. That the characteristic of the lamb is that it's obedient, and it's obedient to who? To God's voice. The second characteristic of a lamb is that it's attracted to the light. If you have a dark room, and they have a light in one corner, and in the other corner, it's all dark, all the lambs will gather around the light because they're attracted to light. They don't have a real strong uh, eyesight, so they gather around the light. But I think there's something significant to the symbolism of that as a sheep or a lamb, is that they like to stay in the light. They like to, to stay exposed. They, they are a representative of living what? Righteously, living in the light and not living in the dark. So number two characteristic of a lamb is not only being obedient, but secondly, attracted to staying in the light and living by righteous behavior. Number three, lambs are vulnerable animals. Hey, Mama Kelly, good to see you. Lambs are vulnerable animals, which means that Lambs don't really have a, a strong defense system. Like a porcupine's got his thing, right? A, a skunk has his thing. Armadillo has a hard shell. A lamb doesn't have much. It's vulnerable. Like it's, it's sitting prey for, for the bear. It's sitting prey for the, for the wolves. And yet... Jesus is described as what? The Lamb of God. What I would propose to you is that Jesus was not only called the Lamb of God because he sacrificed himself up on the cross to take away the sins, but he actually took on the character of a lamb. He was absolutely obedient to the voice of God 
He was attracted to the light and he lived in the light with righteous behavior. And number three, he was vulnerable. He loved. He took the chance of being hurt. And, and his vulnerability was part of the hallmark of how he interacted with people. In order to love, you have to be vulnerable, doesn't it? Isn't that true? In order to, to love our spouses, we literally become totally vulnerable. To love our neighbor, we become vulnerable. Jesus was the master lover, and he was vulnerable. So I want you to keep these three characteristics in mind, obedient to the voice of God. The other thing I want to say about obedient to God's voice is that lambs have pinpoint hearing. That's one of the highest characteristics is that they can hear real well, and they remember the voice of the shepherd. So say Rhonda was a, a shepherd, and she had a group of sheep. She could disappear for one year, come back, be on the other side of the barn, be talking, and the sheep will hear her voice and say, there's my master. It's significant in a sense that Jesus always heard what, what the father was saying and did what he saw the father doing. But that was part of his obedience, was that he constantly heard the voice of the Father, and followed it, lived in the light, and was vulnerable. Remember those three characteristics as we go through the teaching tonight. In John 1, verse 29, in the Passion Translation, listen what it says. The very next day, John saw Jesus coming to him to be what? Baptized. And John cried out, look, there he is. And listen to how John describes him, God's lamb. There he is. Most translations say the lamb of God, right? And that's sort of the formula for the sacrifice. But isn't that interesting? He says, in this translation, he says, look, there he is. It's God's lamb. And what will he do? He will take away the sins of the world. I told you that a mighty one would come. Isn't that interesting? One of the most vulnerable, meekest of all animals, John describes Jesus as the lamb, and then he says in the next sentence, he's the mighty one. I'm going to tie that in together for you. <laughs> Only an obedient lamb can experience the full empowerment and baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is the characteristic that we need to have in order to fully receive the baptism, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? I would propose to you is that we need to have the characteristics of a lamb. We have to be obedient to the Father's voice. We have to live in righteousness, and we need to be vulnerable. If I'm totally independent, I don't need God. I don't need the Holy Spirit. It's when I see and know my brokenness and my vulnerability before God that I truly know what? That I need him. Number two, the purpose of the baptism is to take away, as it says here, what? The sins of the world. The sin is not just original sin. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to be empowered to take away all the effects of sin. To take away what? Suffering. To take away pain. To take away dysfunction. To take away guilt. To take away sickness. To take away shame. And that's exactly what Jesus did after he was what? Empowered by the Holy Spirit. He led a life of what? Taking away the sins of the world. What was his character like? He was the lamb. But he positioned himself to be fully empowered by what? The Holy Spirit. 
the lamb becomes a mighty one or a powerful lion because he was positioned to receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't seem like the lamb and the lion would go together, right? But yet, when we take on the character of a lamb, it positions us to receive the Holy Spirit's empowerment, and then we become what? A lion. Just keep following me. Next verse. John 1, 32 and 33. Then, as John baptized Jesus, he spoke these words. I see the Spirit of God appear like a dove, descending from the heavenly realm, and look, landing upon him. And it rested upon him from that moment, what, forward. So it didn't just come upon him, but it rested and stayed upon him. God spoke these words to me. This is John still talking. One day you will see the spirit descend and remain. That word remain is also abide. Remain upon a man. And he will be the one I have sent to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the lamb. He's the obedient, righteous, vulnerable one who receives the Holy Spirit. And after he receives the Holy Spirit, then he has ability to baptize others in the Holy Spirit. What's important to see is that the Holy Spirit is the power from heaven to take away the sin or the evil in this world. The Holy Spirit is the power to take away the effects of sin or the effects of evil in this world. How many of y'all look around and see the effects of sin? See it all around you. See it in perhaps in family members or, or neighbors or friends, the effects of sin. I'm not talking about original sin. I'm just talking about uh He's addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, broken families, broken relationships, the effects of sin, uh, greed, um, all the effects of sin. And the Holy Spirit is the power that's upon you that can actually take away those things. Just as Jesus did after he received the Holy Spirit, he went on a rampage for three years destroying sin wherever he went. We know that the great act of the cross and the resurrection was the taking upon himself the sin of the world, but I'm talking about the daily destroying of sin, death. He brought back life, blindness. He brought sight, deafness. He gave hearing back, torment, uh, possession. He freed. So the Holy Spirit is the power from heaven to take away the effects of sin or evil in the world. Number two, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people and lifted, came upon the prophets, then would lift, came upon kings, and then they would lift. But the shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament is that in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and remains. It doesn't go away. When Mama Kelly got baptized in the Holy Spirit, she never lost it. She may have not always felt it, may not have been aware of it, but the New Testament reality is, just like Jesus is our model, the Holy Spirit lands upon her and rests upon her from that moment forward. The spirit that is upon you has not gone away. It's there and it remains. And we need to stir our faith to know that, that that's a shift of the New Testament modeled by Jesus. Third, he or she 
that is baptized in the Holy Spirit can now baptize others in power to take away sin. Just as Jesus was baptized by the Spirit, it remained on him, and then it says he will be the one that's sent to baptize with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you that those that were baptized in the Holy Spirit by Jesus did the same for others. That it positions you to baptize others in power so that they can become instruments of taking away sin, taking away sickness, taking away dysfunction, taking away pain, taking away all the things that are effects of the evil one. <clears throat> Listen, Jesus is your prototype. Jesus is my prototype. Jesus is the one who is the lamb that became what? That becomes the lion. Isn't it interesting when Jesus was empowering his 72, he says, I'm sending you out as what? Sheep among wolves. Why did he do that? Sheep get slaughtered by wolves, but what he was empowering them was that you need to maintain the character of the sheep, but I'm empowering you with the spirit so that even when you go among the wolves, you won't be defeated by the wolves, but you will defeat the wolves, even though you have the character of a sheep. Look, the 72 did not come back beat up and killed and dead. They came back and they declared, even, even the evil spirits were obedient to us because they were empowered as yielding lambs and they took on the character and power of a lion. So Jesus is your prototype. He's my prototype. In Acts 1.8, you know, it says, but I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with what? Power. And you will be my messengers. His promise is that we will get the Spirit. When the Spirit comes upon us, we fill with power. And then we go out and be his messengers. I want you to see in the lives of John and Peter, John and Peter, you go from one Acts, Acts 1, 8, they were promised this in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them in power. They position themselves as lambs, obedient, righteous, vulnerable. They received the Holy Spirit and then they became lions. So it says in Acts 8, fast forward, when they went to see the Samaritans and the Samaritans started to receive Jesus, they said they sent Peter and John to pray over them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. As soon as Peter and John arrived, they laid their hands on the Samaritan believers, one after another, and the Holy Spirit fell and filled each one of them. What's important to see is that it was not only Jesus that baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was those that received the Spirit were now empowered to lay hands and give that same power to others. In this case, Peter and John passing it on to who? The Samaritans. Peter and John went from being lambs to receiving the Spirit to becoming bold as lions after receiving the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and then started passing it on to others. Can the same be said about you and me? Peter and John, after they received the Spirit, began to take away sin. One of the first things they did was they healed a cripple at the temple, at the gate beautiful, taking away sin. How did they do it? By the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. 
Peter and John duplicated the process that was done from Jesus to them by baptizing others in the Holy Spirit. And we, as Jesus' ecclesia, are called to do the same, to empower others to do what? To have power to take away sin, to take away the effects of sin. It's an interesting parallel is that in order to receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we need to maintain the character of a lamb. And then when we maintain the character of the lamb, we receive the Holy Spirit. Then we become a lion. So what are the implications? The lamb, which we said is obedient, and the lamb is righteous, and the lamb is vulnerable, that is the position that you and I have that makes us available to fully receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You add to that the Holy Spirit, and what comes to that lamb is empowerment, boldness, and wisdom. And that equals what? To become a lion. Yeah. And the lion is the one that has what? Dominion. Takes away sin. The power in the, the, the natural being empowered by the spirit to take away sin and that's where kingdom invasion occurs. We don't become a lion by acting like a lion. We become a lion by being a lamb or a sheep that receives the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. There's a spiritual paradox, right? Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Uh, what is it? Receive the kingdom of heaven. Something like that. But there's this paradox of that. It's in the midst of meekness that I receive power and become a conqueror. Jesus was the prototype for you and I. And it's this, it's this divine paradox is that it's those that are dependent upon the Holy Spirit that become those that have dominion and seem like they have power. I was talking to uh, our, our friend Joel today. I had coffee with Joel. In fact, I'm going to have Joel teach next week. And he's in the marketplace. And we we're talking about how do you succeed in the marketplace? It's the same formula in the marketplace as it is in all areas, is that we become obedient, righteous, and vulnerable before the Lord. We receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, receive wisdom. And then we start being able to have dominion and kingdom invasion in whatever our sphere of influence is in the marketplace, which includes business success and prosperity, which includes working smarter and not harder, which includes listening to God for divine strategies and, and divine uh, connections. It's, it's bringing this empowerment into the marketplace and then him bringing us to a place of dominion. And we begin to use the empowerment there to take away sin in those areas and there's kingdom invasion. So we have this dynamic here where we take on the character of an, a lamb, we receive positions us to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and then it equals us becoming a lion. <laughs> so this is our activation. Number one is to practice the three attributes of a lamb which is practicing being obedient to God's voice in every area of your life. 
I was talking to a, a lady today and, and she, she works at an office and she's young and put in a high position in her thirties. And she's got a real high position in our company. I said, put the God chair up in your office, close the door, put the God, put Jesus in that chair and talk to him about whatever issues you're dealing with at work and ask him for his input, be obedient to his voice. So practice the three attributes of being obedient to his voice, hanging out in the light, righteous behavior, righteous action, integrating righteous means integrating kingdom principles righteously and maintaining a vulnerable heart before God and people. As we do that, then we position ourselves, what? For the Holy Spirit. So secondly, the activation is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for empowerment, for wisdom. And then our job is what? To give it away. To give it away. Holly Kim often talks about the lesson that she learned was that the way you to keep the anointing of the Holy Spirit is by giving it away. That's the way you keep it. You give it away. And number three, I want you to expect kingdom dominion in every area of your life. Kingdom dominion in your personal life, in your family life, in your marketplace, in government, if you involve with government, kingdom dominion in your city, in our city, in our region, and in our nation. And the dominion comes not because I'm an egomaniac who exerting my own strength. Dominion comes because I carry the character of a lamb and I get empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then it's in that combination that dominion starts to happen in every area of our lives. Amen. Amen. We're going to process this, but uh, give you a chance to, to give if you would like to like to give today. Uh, we have our three ways of doing that. Venmo, you can give to Voice of the Kingdom. Uh, if you do PayPal, Voice of the Kingdom dash New Orleans. Or you could go to our website at uh, voiceofthekingdom.org and there's a way to donate there. And so uh, if, you're, if you're able to give and uh, to support our work, we thank you for that and bless you for that. Amen and amen. <laughs>